Morning, folks. Morning. Morning. It's nice and warm, warm and balmy down here in South Dakota. I like it. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> uh, getting to the point, I'm tired of my snowblower and needs another oil change ready. I changed it last fall. Uh, I don't know if you guys have gotten a bunch of snow or not, but um, okay. All right. So um, there's some really cool signs up here and this type of stuff. Why healthy soil, when the rain comes for your soil be ready, unlock your farm's potential. I really like what's on those signs. Decreasing input costs, protecting against drought. How do you manage for that? And I'll say the same thing about this definition. The continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. That's a beautiful description, but I don't know how to put that onto the farm. Okay. Now, I don't have anything wrong with that, but I just think it's really hard to deal with it. So I'm gonna talk about some low-hanging fruit, some things that I think are some goals that a person should use when you're trying to use cover crops as a tool. And yes, I think cover crops are a really good tool. I think they're an important tool. And up here are some of my goals that we use in North Dakota. This is what your neighbors are working with. Erosion, too much water, not enough water. I always tell people every year we have a flood and a drought the same year. Anybody? Have that kind of thing going on? Yeah, okay. A little bit of salts. You know, maybe you don't have salinity, but I bet your neighbors do. Um, and then a few weed problems that we're dealing with. And we're using cover crops for part of the system in all of this. So I want to convince you, first of all, that we still have problems. That we still have significant problems. Okay, that's, that's your grazing stick from South Dakota. I stole that from you guys. And I just stuck it in the, in the dirt there, and she's standing on her own. That's the second wire of the bob wire fence it's leaning up against. This, uh, this sand was blown 200 yards out into the neighbor's field. And this is the field that we work on. Came from the other guy. And it was all sand, right? Because all the clay and all the silt floats away. So there were six to eight inches of sand here along this border. We also inherited pigweed, lamb's quarters, and nightshade. You know, this idea that the dirty 30s were the only time that we had significant wind erosion is a falsehood. It continues every day. 35 mile an hour, and that was easy to get. I just held it up and took a picture. The gusting was up to 40. I didn't wait for it. And guys will say, well, no till will help you with that. Both sides of the road here are no till, soybeans. Both sides of the road. There's no residue left, right? You guys know this. There's nothing to hold that soil in, and away it goes. This was a year ago, production-wise. This still happens, and it happens a lot. Anybody know this one? Snur? <clears throat> yeah, I was up in Canada, PEI here not too long ago, and they got red dirt. Theirs is just a different color. They still have snur, same thing. How about where we farmed and where we haven't farmed? Right? And the grower I'm working for in this picture has actually never been tillage. This was done a long time ago, but it still continues to happen. Here's your A layer, here's your B layer, we're down into C layer. Again, no-till soybean ground after a heavy rain event. Here's another one at the bottom of a hill. You could park my F-150 in there and everybody says that's a good place for a Ford. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> but you could park it in there and not see it. And this is in the middle of the field, so this is in a very inconvenient place to go around and cut around. So what does the farmer do? Anybody know? Plows are shut. Plows are shut, pushes in the good snow, the good, not snow, but soil, <laughs> into this and it washes out again next year, right? Because yep. there's a flood and a drought every year. Yep. This is not snow. So I showed you my snow. My snow is black and my soils are white. Something's a little upside down with that, right? Now this, these of course are the horrific pictures, but this exists and this picture's not hard to get. I took this picture in April. And it's mostly uh, gypsum and some mag sulfate, that kind of thing. It's at least two inches thick. It's around all the sloughs, some of the road ditches and some of those areas where water sets too long, right? Anybody seen salts, salinity in this neighborhood? 281 corridor is kind of famous for it, right? just in the right area for it. Here's what it looks like from the air in a different field. 
This is a drone picture from this year. This is in mid-June and that's a soybean field. You like the canopy control, the weeds we have there, guys? How about the yield potential in here? How about this one? So what I'm trying to do is convince you that your neighbors have a problem in North Dakota. These things still happen, these things are still going on, these are this year's pictures. Because it's a lot easier to look at your neighbor and say, boy, he's really doing something wrong. What I want you to do here is leave here and think about your fields in a different light, look at them in a different way, look for some of these problems, some of these low-hanging fruit. Because folks, even though soybeans might pencil in the black on this field, he's not making money, is he? Because you can't just take your average yield and put it in those acres. So these are the acres I tell you to fire. Fire these acres. And what does that mean? Now if you had an employee that came every Friday, collected his check and never saw him the rest of the week, would he still work there? I hope not. But it's basically what this acre is doing, right? Gets his check up front, gets the seed, gets the fertilizer, gets the spray, gets all your inputs up front and gives you nothing in the end. So fire that acre. I have growers argue with me, but I'm paying rent on it. Okay, well then make that your only debt. Save all of your input costs. Do something else. When you got the hired man that wraps uh, your, your planter around the telephone poles, you take them out of the planter, don't you? Well, take this out of soybean production is what I'm telling you to do. You maybe you give that guy a broom, okay? That's what I'm telling you to do, give this a broom. Fire those acres and do something different with them. Anybody have this guy? North Dakota lost its mind this year when we found Palmer amaranth. We found 20 some plants and we lost our mind. This is a terrible, horrible, nasty weed. These pictures are water hemp in North Dakota. That's a bad weed too and we've been ignoring it largely. The other one we've ignored is this one. This is the one I call job security. This is Kosha. This is my friend. He will keep me in business till I want to quit, for sure. He's resistant to glyphosate. He's resistant to all ALS chemicals. Dicamba's not doing the job. The Starane's not doing the job. And this is a grower who uh, decided that I didn't know what I was talking about as far as resistance goes. So he decided he was going to prove me wrong. Two gallons per acre of Roundup and eight gallons of water sprayed at 10 GPA. You heard me. Two, G two gallons of Roundup per acre. Now he got the neighbor and this guy and this guy over here, but this one and this one and that one. So now what happens the next time we have kosher in this field? It's worse. Exactly. There's a couple of definitions for moron. <laughs> All right. Here's what happens when you let that go. <clears throat> this is barley planted into this field. This is a quarter section that one of my growers picked up for cheap because the guy had been farming it before, planted soybeans, and then the year after that he planted soybeans. Let me think, what did he plant? Yeah, soybeans. And what was the next? Yeah, soybeans again. Yeah, that's right. Because they were penciling good on the paper. And they were the cheaper ones. They were glyphosate. And he was in a tight spot. And pre's are expensive. And different management's expensive. And 138 acres, 32 of them were harvested that fall. He decided there was something wrong with that land and sold it. My grower, having more faith in me than he should have, bought it. And said, you can fix that, can't you? I don't know. That's solid kosher, folks. And that's that same kind of kosher I was just talking about. Luckily for us, kosher is only three years or so in the, in the soil. We're able to change the cropping system. Uh, most of the seed dies off after that. And we purposely tried to get as much of it to grow as we possibly could every year to hit it hard. But he was mad at me. He's like, I'm not making any money in that field. I said, you're in a reclamation project, sir. Now this is a picture I show to people and I see this all the time. Hopefully I never would see this in South Dakota, but unfortunately I've seen it. Anybody want to put a combine through that? No. This picture is taken in August, so the kosher has gone to seed. My question is why? 
if you know you're not going to combine that, why did the kosher go to seed? And the grower says to me, well, I did everything I could. I sprayed everything I could on it. That's not everything you can do. That's not even close. Mow that off. Get rid of it. Don't let it go to seed. Faith and dicamba, this was two years ago. There's the dead ones, there's the live ones. Fourteen days, folks. Dicamba works in five. Keep it in mind. I'm not saying that they're bad tools. I'm just saying don't hang your head on them. Okay? So that's why I'm talking about cover crops as tools, because there's something else in your toolbox. Now, a few things I want to talk about. And this is the point when slide that people tend to argue with me. That's cool. That's fine. This is just my opinion, my experiences, what I've seen. Trust the science. Now, I'm going to give you a bunch of anecdotal stuff. I'm going to talk about what I've seen, but I do a lot of science reading. I've done a lot of work learning about science, and I stick with it. Good science will lead you in the right direction. Be careful with experts, including bald-headed bearded guys from North Dakota. <laughs> Just because I think it works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you, right? This is all tailored. Every one of your farms and ranches is different. What you're trying to do, what your goals are, where you're trying to get, what works for you, what makes sense for you is all different. I'm trying to give you some ideas. Take them, morph them, try them, try new ideas, try other ideas. Make them fit in your farm. That's what I'm trying to do. So that's what I'm saying about don't worry about the rules. The rules, the guidelines, I like the five guidelines for soil health. I like them, but if you have to bend them a little bit to get them to fit, go for it. I'll take progress, okay? If you're moving in the right direction, if you're taking on these challenges of erosion, water management, salinity, and weeds, like we are, sometimes we've got to bend the rules a little bit, and that's all right. The other thing I'll say is I don't think agriculture is the same thing as nature. This is one I get a lot of argument on, that's fine. But in my opinion, agriculture is about producing as much food for one species as you possibly can. Right? That's not really how nature works. Lots of things feed on an acre in nature, okay? So keep that in mind. I don't think they're the same thing. And I'll even go so far as to say I'm not sure that there are pests in nature. Because if that's true, I'm a pest of beef cattle because I will kill them and eat them. <laughs> you see my point? Okay. The other thing I'll say, and, and again, you can argue with this, I don't think your A student needs a tutor. If your A student's already getting 94% in a class and you hire a tutor for 100 bucks a month and they get a 95, are you jumping up and down? Are you excited? How about Timmy who's getting a D, right? 100 bucks may bring him up to a C. I'm jumping up and down now. So my point is those acres that you fired and we're gonna give them a broom, let's give them the tutor. Let's work on them. Let's work on those. They've got the biggest potential for gain. Start there. The other thing is you've got very little potential for loss, right? If it's giving you nothing back, what are you out? Just your expenses. And then remember, it takes time. I've heard a few farmers that are really good soil health farmers talk about they wish they'd have done a lot more at the beginning. And maybe that's true. But I've seen more guys fail trying to do more at the beginning. And the point here is, again, like I said, I was in Canada. And those kids are born with hockey skates on. And you should see the kind of gear they can buy them. You can buy $5,000 worth of gear for a six-year-old, no problem. Now you put him on the rink with a 20-year-old, do you think he's gonna be able to compete? What's the difference? Same gear, probably better gear on the six-year-old, to be honest with you, a 20-year-old drinking beer, he's not spending money on gear. <laughs> the difference is practice and time. Time, it takes time for you to learn the skills you need to change your management. It also takes time for your soils to adapt to your management. And biology will adapt to your management, it takes time. It's the same thing I'll say, again, the hockey thing. Your professional hockey player, you put him on the baseball team, is he ready to go? He's not even close. Well, he's in condition. He's got good muscle mass, lifts weights every day, got good hand-eye coordination, but it's a different sport, right? 
So I'm going to say the same thing for you folks. You are good farmers. You know what you're doing. You have learned the skills that it takes to run your system. You change your system, you're going to need some different skills. Okay? Keep that in mind. And it takes a little time to acquire them. Not near as much time as it does from the ground up. But if you're going to move into no-till, that's a different skill. If you're going to move into using cover crops, that's a different skill. So I'm just going to show you a few things that we're doing in North Dakota. Doesn't mean they're right, they're wrong. They are what they are, okay? Uh, some of the things we're doing is we're doing a lot more reduced tillage, trying to get guys to go as no-till as they can, but not everybody works that way. It's not the way they want to do it. I'm okay with progress. I would like to see no-till. And we're splitting fields. So I showed you those pictures of those acres that aren't paying. We're taking them out of the system. We're putting them into a different job. And we're adding covers, a big part of that. And then the next thing here says use the right species. One of the things that I get frustrated about is we talk about cover crops like they're one thing. Anybody ever been to a three-day meeting on corn? How about soybeans? We'll have a whole convention on one crop, right? Because there's so much to learn. There's so much to know. There's so many differences. How many cover crops are there? 20, 30, 40, 50, easily? And we talk about them like they're one thing? You'll hear your neighbor say, oh, I tried cover crops and they didn't work. Anybody hear that? Which ones? What were you trying to do? What was your goal? What was your problem? Did you take care of them? Or did you just throw them out there and go, here, good luck? We're carefully adjusting our inputs. Um, I think there's some really awesome things that happen when you get into a soil health system. But I'm not going to promise them to you. Okay? This year we had really good rain. We had good weather in, in North Dakota. We had wonderful crops. We had a hell of a horrible harvest. But we had wonderful crops. And my soil health guys reaped the benefits of it. That doesn't happen every year from what I've seen. And we're still learning how to do this. We're still tweaking it. But uh, we're carefully adjusting things as far as weed control goes. You saw my weed control pictures, folks. I don't want to skip a step. That one where I talk about the combine, that kosher can have 300,000 seeds per plant. What's your corn seeding rate? Right around 30,000-ish? 10 acres worth of seed on one kosher plant? I don't want to screw that up. So here's some of the stuff we're doing. Section, big half sections, and we're cutting it up in all little pieces. And people go, why would you do that? It's so nice to drive end to end, watch a YouTube video for five minutes, turn around. <laughs> you laugh because it's true. <laughs> Hopefully you watch these YouTube videos again this summer, OK? You can put them on pause when you turn and just hit play again. It's no problem. Why would you cut this up? Well, this is that saline area that I was talking about. This is the one that isn't paying any money. He's not coming to the table. This spot right here. And that's planted into barley because it's the most tolerant crop we have for solidity. So we plant it into barley. But we don't have high expectations. This is the guy who needs a broom, okay? You don't put him in the planter. So we're not putting a bunch of fertility out there. First of all, you soil test these areas, you find out there's a lot of fertilizer left. Because what happened? Fertilized it for 20 years and never used it. Exactly. So the phosphorus numbers are 40, 50 parts per million. Potassium is 300 to 500. Nitrogen is 500 pounds because the water moves to that area and takes the nitrogen with it. You got more than enough. Besides that, the potential here is reduced because the salts are reducing the potential. So whatever you get out of this is a bonus. So all we put in here is, first of all, we don't put soybeans in here and save 200 bucks. That's the first thing. Second thing is we go in with barley whenever you can get there. Everybody will tell me, well, you've got to plant barley early to get the best yield. I'm not worried about the best yield. I'm worried about any yield. We planted this in June. That's fine. It'll grow. 35 bushel of malt quality barley. Now, that's not paying any bills, but it's a lot better than zero. What happens when you take the zeros out of your yield monitor, guys? A lot of cool things happen. 
And if you start getting a little bit clever, a little bit sneaky, you can spray banville on barley, which is dicamba. You can spray ingenia on soybeans. And some of these labels actually have a label for small grains of corn, some of the ingenia and some of that stuff. But at the very least, you can spray right up to the border and not worry about drift, right? So we didn't have to have any weeds in here. Okay. Now, he should have went a little further back here. This should have been one block. But hey, you learn, right? Okay. And this, on this other side, this triangular piece here is some corn. It had a lot of gosses wilt. We're not going to plant that variety again. But rather than squaring this off, because you'll see right here, there's a spot where nothing really grows. Rather than planting corn in there, we just don't. We change the border on the field. It makes more sense. Instead of being negative whatever it costs you to plant corn, we're putting rye, barley, oats, turnips, radishes, trying to fix this spot. We fired it from corn production because it sucks. Make sense? Are these really that difficult to rounds? No, they're not. Here's another one. Nice little quarter. When we originally started with this quarter years ago, soybean average yield on this was about 22 bushel. This is currently three fields. You can see the one here on the left. This is grass and CRP. The landowner gets a check. The renter doesn't pay rent. It's not good CRP, but it's better than dead soybeans. Then right next to it, we have this L-shaped piece right here that was put into rye this year. And then we followed with a cover crop. This is a little picture before we planted the cover crop. And that rye did 37 bushel an acre. And we did the same thing that we did with the barley. We just didn't put a whole lot of inputs into it. The grower didn't like it because he didn't have a whole lot of acres, but he was harvesting in the end of July. Is your combine really busy in the end of July? So he had time to do it, but it was monkeying around. It was farting around. It was a few acres. It was a one truckload. It didn't want to dry down, and I don't think it was any good. And I think soybeans would have done just as well. No, you know they wouldn't. We've tried them 15 years in a row. I don't know what makes you think they would have worked this year. Okay. And this right here was the good soybean ground, so we planted the soybeans. Makes perfect sense. We've been doing this for about four years. You know what the average on this field is now? 47. What's that do for your insurance? What's that do for your security as a farmer? And all the while, you've reduced your input costs. You've had to fart around. You had to use that stupid little bin on the corner that Dad put up in 1976 <laughs> with an old drag auger that never starts to put that little bit of rye in there. This guy up here is laughing because he knows it's true, right? It's making you money. It makes sense. Fire that acre and give it another job. One of my favorite farmers, but notice he's looking down. And I want to talk about this. He doesn't want his face on this photo. Why? He grows cover crops. That's why. He doesn't want his neighbors to know that I'm showing this picture all over hell. Because they're just waiting for him to fail so they can rent his land. Well, cover crops are stupid, all that money in the cover crops. You're not getting any money out of that. Why would you do that? Peer pressure is a real thing, isn't it? It's a real thing. What your neighbors think about you is important. Maybe what your landlords think about you is more important, right? But is that a reason to lose money? Is that a reason to farm those acres that I showed you earlier? Or is that a reason to have a conversation, a discussion, to talk about things, or to see your farm with a different eye, to look at it differently? Now that radish he's holding is 30 days old. Actually, it was planted 30 days before this picture, so I can't even say 30 days old. It was planted in August, behind field P now. We're cheating, I got in early. Well, that was on purpose. We wanted to put cover crops on this piece of ground. This is a light, sandy piece of ground. It tends to blow a lot, doesn't hold a whole lot of water. Told you about the flood and the drought, right? Well, this field never floods, but we have water early and we have none late. So do soybeans make any sense? They don't use any water early and they need a ton late. They don't make any sense, do they? 
We put in field peas. Guess what? Field peas are the opposite. They, they plant early, they canopy early, they use water early, and they don't like the heat. He's been getting 50, 60 bushel field peas as an average when he was getting 15 bushel of soybeans. Now you do the math. That makes a lot of sense. And then behind that, we've got all kinds of time to put in cover crops. And what we're doing here is we're trying to increase our organic matter. We're trying to reduce our erosion. So I'm putting in oats as the main carrier here because it'll frost kill and it'll grow with a little bit of water. We're using some radishes to help balance the carbon and nitrogen just a little bit. We're putting some flax in. You can see one right by his foot. I wish I had a better picture of it to try to get some snow catch to stand upright. Because if I get more water on here, this field does better. If I get a higher organic matter, it'll hold more water and keep it longer. Okay. Every cover crop that we use, I have a purpose for. I have a reason to put it in. And I would encourage you to think the same way. These things are tools. Yes, you need 10, 9, 16 wrenches, but you don't need it every time, right? Sometimes you need a sledgehammer. And sometimes you need a 3 8 Each one of these things is a tool that has different qualities and different purposes and different uses. Now, the other thing that this farmer's done is he's gone to a stripper header. The main reason for that stripper header is because the residue is a nightmare to deal with in no-till, and he's been fighting with it. He can run faster with the stripper header. He's not running the, the straw through it. The straw is anchored to the soil, and guess what? It's evenly put through the field. Something they learned right away. That grain car driver needs to follow the combine. Because if he's just driving out there willy-nilly, it's like a pat, petting a cat backwards. Follow me? A straw is laying all different directions. And if it's not breaking down, it's a nightmare to plant into. They learned that the first year. Okay, Tom, you're going to follow the tracks of the combine, okay? No more of this driving all over. Little things you learn that way. And this is the same thing. This is another sandy field. It's the same kind of thing. Oats, radish, rye. Or not rye so much, but because we don't want to grow it next spring. You guys will ask me, well, how do you plant this stuff? Do you broadcast your soybeans and corn and expect a crop? Is that the best way to seed that stuff? I will encourage you to plant it any time you can. You guys are farmers, you know how to grow plants. The best way is to put them in the soil, make sure they got moisture. Now, given that, you can't necessarily do that every time. So yes, if you're gonna go ahead and broadcast them, do it. But try to line things up to your best interest. And I tell people, I plan for a rain. And that usually gets a laugh, right? How do you plan for a rain? Well, I plant earlier for our cover crops because we're more likely to have rain at the end of June or early July than we are at the end of July and early August, for sure. So for us, aerial seeding a rye in August has been 30% chance of a hit. If we do it in early July, it's a 70% chance of a hit. And in here, this is just a single disc drill. It's got two tanks on it. You put the larger seeded in one tank, you put the smaller seeded in the second tank, and away you go. And if you're only putting down one or two pounds of radishes or something like that, put a little 1152 with them. Guess what? They run really good. Makes sense. Okay. Here's that broadcast rye. This is what it looks like at harvest time. And this was applied in mid-June, mid to late June. We're doing it at our side dress timing. Now, I'm not saying that's going to work for you. Okay, because I've seen issues with longer day corn, 100, 105 day corn, tends to be pretty dark in the canopy. My corn in general is not. We're looking at 85 day to 95 day. Most of it's right around 92. And most of the time it's not that dark in the canopy. So a lot of this stuff will live, but it's sick. It's spindly, this is three leaf rye that's this tall. It's looking for sunlight. It's like, hey, where's the sun? Okay, well the corn's bigging that up. So we're going in there where we're top dressing our corn with a two bin machine. The front bin has got a little bit of urea and a little bit of EMS. The back bin's got cereal rye. And we're actually variable rating the cereal rye now because this is that rolling topography. So the hills, I don't want a whole lot of cereal rye next spring. The low spots, I want more. So we've been putting 15, 20 pounds on the hill, 30 to 40 on the side hill, and 60 to 80 in the low spot, trying to manage water. Now what'll happen is if you try this, you'll go along and there'll be a spot where the rye is amazingly huge and there's no corn. 
You'll go, that damn rye killed my corn. No. What happens to corn at this stage when you give it a little bit of water and a little bit of fertilizer? Next week, what's it look like? It's twice as big. How big is your rye next week? Maybe sprouted. This big. Two weeks from now, it's three feet tall corn and it's got one leaf rye. You think that's even a competition? The biggest hog of the trough is going to win. Now, we have a leaky system in agriculture, don't we? There are leftovers. And if I talk about Thanksgiving dinner, there's always leftovers at my house, even though I eat a lot. Okay? But I want you to think about this. If you took your Thanksgiving leftovers and put them on the porch and left them, would they stay there? Why wouldn't they stay there? Coon, right? Raccoon? You can be mad and shoot the raccoon. You killed him. It's the end of it. You're done, right? Your leftovers are going to stay there. No problem. Well, there's not a coon, by the way. You shoot all of them. They're just gunk. Okay? You get really good and you shot everything with four legs. Is it still going to stay there? Flies, fungi, all this. Right? Mother Nature doesn't like leftovers, does she? Something's going to take advantage of it. So what I tell people is if you get a dog... This is my dog. Because in this system, there's leftover sunlight, leftover nutrients, and leftover water. And what's going to take them? Water, hemp, kochia, common ragweed, you name it. Now I get a dog, because if you've got a dog on your porch, he's going to eat your leftovers and chase coons away. <laughs> That's kind of what my rye's doing here, right? It's competing for that little bit of leftover. This is what it looks like here on the right side after harvest. Same field. Get a little bit of sunlight to it. That's what it was lacking. And it thickens up. Gives me a nice cover on that. Helps reduce erosion. Helps increase infiltration. Helps do all of those things on that side. Okay. So everybody says, well, soybeans. How do we do this in soybeans? Because the acres that I work on is over 50% soybean. So if I'm trying to make a difference, I've got to figure out something for soybean, right? So we've done this. We've tried this. In North Dakota, we broadcast soybeans at about this time. That yellow soybean leaf, it's going to be about 7 to 10 days. All the leaves are going to fall off, right? You guys have seen this. Okay? Leaves fall down on it. It stays moist. Your cover crops grow. You know how often that happens? My experience has been one in nine years that works. I'm not saying don't try it, but I'm saying have realistic expectations. One in nine years, this works. And this is where it worked. And the grower who's done it says, well, it's never been an issue in the combine. So yeah, it's only worked once. <laughs> it's only this big, so it's not a problem. We were combining snow beans this high this year, you know? They were huge. So a little bit of rye growing in there, a little bit of radish growing in there, that's fine. I get that. Um, I'm not a huge fan of having cereal rye ahead of corn in North Dakota. It's not worked for me. It may work for you. I know some people in Nebraska like to do it. That's fine. In Nebraska, they wait to plant things. I don't know about you guys, but as soon as we can get out in the field, we go plant corn. We don't have any time. Nebraska's like, yeah, we'll get to it next week. You know, we'll wait till it's 50 degrees soil temp. Really? My guys will plant at 42 or whatever the temperature is today to get it done. So that's a different story. So Nebraska talks about killing your rye two weeks before you plant your corn. Well, we don't have that time, so I don't like to do that. But again, it doesn't mean it's not going to work. Have your expectations, try different things. This one's a little bit harder to see, but in the center of this picture here, you'll see there's barley there. And off on the beginning, you'll see there's soybeans here, and in the back, you'll see there's soybeans there. What in the world is going on now? Well, this is one of those acres we decided to fire. And again, it was a disc drill, front tank, back tank. I had plenty of fertilizer out there, and if we needed phosphorus, we'd just spread it in the fall. The barley in the back tank. And when he hit this spot, the plan was to turn off the soybeans and turn the barley on. Well, he turned the barley on, but he didn't turn the soybeans off, because you never know. <laughs> you just never know. They might grow. Well, sorry, boss, but glad you turned the barley on. Let's put it that way. And this is my dog. Folks, that's my dog, because that spot, nothing else grows except for kochia, right? And it grows really well. It does a hell of a job in there, and it'll produce a lot of seed. The barley grew. It was this tall. We didn't harvest it. We had no plans to harvest it. This is weed control. 
This was water management. This is saline management, all three in one crop. And he didn't do an extra pass. Oh, by the way, he didn't change any part of his program. We sprayed a pre-emerge on this. We sprayed an authority product. Anybody know how good authority is on killing grass? Not. Oh, and then by the way, they were Liberty Link soybeans. And we didn't have to spray them until later until the barley was pretty big. How good is Liberty on big grass? <coughs> Meh. We never did kill the barley. But you can't harvest that because we sprayed two off-label herbicides on it, but it's still a cover crop. Just because you're using herbicides doesn't mean you're going to kill every cover crop. And if you kill one or two, I don't really care, to be quite honest with you. Sometimes you need to. So this system worked out. Now, if he'd have turned his soybeans off, he'd have made a fair amount of money on this deal. But in the end, he was still managing salinity, he was still managing kochia, he's still managing his water, so it helped. Now this is an old picture. This one's at least 12 years old. This is when we first started using cereal rye to combat salt spots. So the soybeans would never grow, the place was dead. We'd plant, so the slough is over on this side here. The, the low slough ground and there's a bunch of salty, nasty stuff there. And we planted cereal rye there in the fall, I convinced the grower to get 50 bushels and put it in and just say, you know, just put it in. And next year, if you want to plant your soybeans and they're fine, plant your soybeans in and then kill it off, okay? It's, there's a way out of this. And I came back the next year, and so you can see there's a slough that goes around this way. And he came up with a sprayer here, and he turned right this, and he went back that way. And he never sprayed right here. So there's no herbicides there at all. None. See anything interesting about that picture? How about this one? To the line. Now remember when I was talking about that kosher? <laughs> what doesn't work on it? That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Now, did it kill them all? No. So what's going on here? Well, cereal rye gets going stupid early in the spring. It's already got to start in the fall. It makes it through my nasty North Dakota winters. Okay? It's very competitive. It grows very fast. And there's also a thing called a lily path. It throws a little toxin out into the soil. And we don't know a lot about that, but we do know some of that and that it does affect broadleaves pretty specifically, and kochia obviously is on that list. I like that list. I'm gonna use that. That's a cool tool. So we start using this big time, like yeehaw. Rye has to be a size. I don't know if the rye has to be a certain size or not. We've done it. So uh, here's what I'll say. Depending on when, how big your rye is and how big your kochia is next spring, you're gonna get varying results. This is a biological system, okay? <laughs> It's going to be varying results. That's, that's all I can say on it. But we've had good results with it often. So we've done a lot of this. We start planting whole quarters that are bad kochia. I showed you the pictures, right? There's a couple of fields in North Dakota for sure that have bad kochia. We start planting these fields in the fall to cereal rye, and we just seed right into them, planting green. Yeehaw, no problem. It's not that hard. This one's pretty big. It's pretty thin. My grower's standing 10 feet away. Again, he doesn't want his face in the picture. You don't want anybody to know. Because the neighbors drove by and it looked nice and green and he went out and he uh, planted into it like I showed you. Then he went out and he sprayed it and everybody's like, what are you doing? That looks so good. Well, the point was weed control. I don't want the rye. And this is what it looked like after planting. Like, oh my God, nothing's going to come up. The neighbors are talking. Oh man, was it going. You couldn't go in the coffee shop. A couple weeks later, it looks like this. Well, it's not so bad. Anybody here garden or ever plant a tree? What do you use right around the base of the tree for weed control? Mulch? Did I hear mulch? What's that look like? Oh, you guys are quick learners. Here's the soybeans mid-season. Guess what we still have in there? A little bit of mulch. I just got three months worth of weed control. You tell me another way I can get that for seven bucks. I'm all ears. 13 now, I don't care. Flexstar's over 20 and doesn't kill the damn thing. <laughs> now, if you notice this, and maybe you can't quite tell, those soybeans are a little bit yellow. And they're a little bit short. 
okay? So what was going on here is we have too much carbon in this system and it's stealing some nitrogen from us. But to be quite honest with you, I don't really care in this system. Now, you might want to balance this, but what luckily for me happened is that the grower thought he ran out with one round left on this quarter, packed up, folded up, rolled down the road about a mile or so, and he goes, you know, I better check the tank. Sure enough, he had just enough left for one more round. So instead of going back to this field, he just swung into the quarter that was there and he planted off around, which was brilliant. I love check strips. Okay, so we had a heck of a good check strip in here. When two different fields and they were close to each other, not the same thing, but they were very close. And where he didn't plant the CRI in this field, the soybeans were eight inches taller and they were darker green. But the internode spacing, the distance between the pods on these was about this big. The distance between the pods where he didn't plant the CRI was about this big. And counting pods and soybeans is a futile effort, but we did it anyway. And we really couldn't see any differences. And nothing showed up on the yield map. And even if we'd had, even if we'd lost a little bit of yield, I would argue to take it for that kind of weed control on a weed I can't kill any other way. Plus the erosion management, plus the infiltration increases, the carbon increases. I'm going a little fast, but that's all right. I'm sure Chris will keep you busy. So here's what I think, and this is just my opinion, okay? There's a lot of measures on soil health. There's a lot of science being done. There's a lot of scientists working really hard at finding good ways to measure soil health. They're still working on it. They got some cool beginnings. But I'm not sure I understand it all yet, and I've been studying it pretty hard. I'm not sure it all makes sense to me yet, and I've been studying it pretty hard. What I do know is that a shovel helps. So that's what I use. Right here is a shovel. Now, that shovel blade's only about four inches wide, and that, that slab of soil, which is not a slab, it doesn't look like flour, does it? I want to convince you today that soil that looks like flour is not a good thing. That's a bad thing. That's an erosion potential. That's a loss of soil. This is soil that's going to stick around. Why? Because it's got aggregates. And if you learn one thing from my talk today, it's aggregates, aggregation, holding things together. This is a loamy soil. After about five, six years, this is what I want it to look like. Little chunks, little Lego blocks all holding together because they don't wash away. They don't blow away. They hold together. And my understanding of this is this is like the city for your microbes. There's different environments, the outside, the inside, different places for them to be. There's a suburb, there's a downtown. So if you want to live in the rock and nightlife, you live there. So if your microbe wants certain things, that's where he lives, right? And they like to be underground and covered up as that's what they were evolved under. You take them a tillage and you throw them up in the air and you dry them out and put them in the sunlight and you put a hurricane through their city, they don't like that. That's a loam. This is 65% clay. And you can tell it was a little wet that day. We dug in with a shovel and I squished it with my hand like this. And that's what my hand looked like. Now, there's a little bit of mud on there. But every time somebody tells me you can't, do, you can't build aggregates in clay soils, that's a lie. There they are. You can do it. And I actually think if you do it right, it doesn't take very long at all. I said, well, I got sand. I can't do it in sand. Well, this is 62% sand. And there they are. It can be done different times, different lengths, but you have to manage for it specifically. Now, these aggregates are not near as strong as the clay ones, but they're still there. Uh, I like above ground growth for cover crops. But I think what's going on below the ground is way more important. This is a little radish, about the size of my pinky, but he's doing a lot of work. I have a lot of guys tell me, well, there's not enough time left in the end of the fall. And some years there isn't. Okay, this year I'm gonna grant you that. I'm gonna give you a pass, right? August was a lot of fun, or October was a lot of fun, wasn't it? <laughs> you got 100 acres done in October, right? Maybe combine and snow beans, everything's frozen, all that kind of stuff. So it's hard to get cover crops in that system. But there's lots of time outside of that. 
And I don't judge the cover crops by above ground growth. Yes, we want density, I want weed control, I need that, but I judge this root growth as being really important too. So when you're assessing success and failure, go back to your goals. What were you trying to manage? What were you trying to accomplish? Did you pick the right species? Did you pick the right tool? Or did you try to fix your watch with a sledgehammer? And then assess it. And if you're not digging, if you don't carry a shovel to assess your cover crops, we don't have a lot to talk about, you and I. That shovel's important. My personal vehicle is a Ford Mustang. I got two shovels in it. And I will pull off to the side of the road randomly in South Dakota, and I don't have any business doing any of that, and dig a hole. I had a guy come by one day and go, what are you doing? I go, what are you doing? <laughs> Confronted him. I got kicked off land anyway, but it was worth it. <laughs> They've got him out front. And if they don't, I bet they'll hook you up with them. This is an infiltration test. You pound a ring in the ground, you pour a half a liter of water on it, and you time it. And you see how long it takes for the water to go in. Anybody interested in that? Because we get a lot of these nice two-day soakers, right, to just rain for, light rain for two hours. <laughs> two days, nice little light rain, half inch of rain for two days. Or do you get five inches in 15 minutes? Well, maybe you get both, but we get a lot more of that fast rain, right? I want to catch as much of that water as possible because I don't have enough left over to give up. I don't want it running into that slough in that low spot where it's going to contribute to salinity and not help my crop. I want it to go into the soil where it falls. So you pound this in the ground, you pour it in there, and you measure it. And I would say get two or three of them or make some. You guys are farmers, you can build anything. Make a few. And here's what I'd say. Make a few, get in the side by side, throw them in the back, grab a case of water, maybe a case of something else, and uh, go to the neighbor's field where he does a lot of tillage and pound a few in there, drop the water in, and then drive away. And go into your field, go into a no-till field, go into the ditch even if you want to, because that's where the aggregates are. Now, if you go in the ditch or a good no-till field, stay there and time it. If you're going into heavy tillage, you can come back in an hour or two or a day or two. This is right out front. This is one of the best ways to do this. This is about aggregate stability. I'm talking about aggregates and where they are and what they look like. And now I want to see how good are they. They got this demonstration out front. So you go out in your soils. You take a clod of dirt and you try to keep it in one piece. You haul it home, you put it on the shelf for a couple weeks. Let it dry, okay, let it dry. And you get the neighbor's field and you do the same thing. And if they're doing a lot of tillage, these are easy clumps, they're just laying on top of their surface of the soil, right? It's not a problem. And you take them home, you let them dry. Then when you get done with this, you get a little bit of screen, a little bit of wire, whatever, you stick them in a quart jar or if you want, this is way more cool. If you want to do a big cylinder, go, do it. And you put them in there and let the water go back in. The ones that have stronger aggregates are going to hold together. They're going to stay together. So the infiltration test shows you how much water goes into it. The slake test shows you how well your aggregates hold up for the next rain. In this rainfall, they blow apart. So now think about all these little holes and all these little root holes and all these little pores that you put into your soil to try to get water into them. What happens when you have a washout in your field to the culvert? Closes it up, that washout closes your culvert up. What do you think this is? This is the same concept. That soil's flushing down and plugs all of those holes. I have 22 ways to kill weeds or to manage them. Herbicides are only one. Yeah, the ones in red are weird. Those are uh, Stolen ideas from other people, those are thought ideas. Steam is one that really gets people wondering what the hell you're talking about. They actually do this in urban areas. They use steam to kill them, pressure washer basically. And you already got a, a machine that has a thousand gallon tank with nozzles on it. And the steamer at home has got a thermal induction nozzle on it, steam cleaner for the carpet. That's my concept on this. I've challenged growers to build this. 
If you build it first, I will come and see it. I will take pictures and post them on the internet. I want to see it. That's what I had. <laughs>